Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out on this Murray rainy day. I'd first like to, uh, well, for those of you whom I don't know, I'm Paul Harrison and I have the privilege of being the principal for the college this year. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to welcome you and acknowledge that uh, UBC's two main campuses are situated on the traditional unceded ancestral territory of here, the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh and in Kelowna, the Salix peoples. Um, as I've said before, UBC is a, a community of learners and I think we all have much to learn uh, from the traditional stewards of this land and the way that they uh, teach and learn. So traditionally we have a short business meeting. I have a chance to tell you a little bit about what's going on with the college. Um, um, some uh, sort of latest news. Um, I've tried to emphasize in this slide and the next one, the value of going to the website for the college frequently to find out what's going on. So here, we're really excited. The in Indigenous Information Booklet is out. Some of you have it in your hand. There were a few copies printed. Um, it's a wonderful resource for us to learn ourselves and together about Indigenous history, uh, place, resources, uh, ways of learning, all sorts of things. So I really urge you to go there on the web and explore that booklet and the various resources. It's, it's a collation of existing resources from various places, other UBC sources, uh, as well as others. And there's so much in there, I get lost every time I start and I get linking to one other thing and another thing. Uh, so please do uh, look at that. The um, research subsidy applications will be on the web at the end of February, and you'll hear about that in the e-news. Um, there'll be the next edition of the newsletter is scheduled to come out in March. It's with the editors right now. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, it was wonderful. I, I heard that they had more than enough submissions of material to fill one newsletter. So there's a start on the next one already. That's what we like, like to see. You sharing with other members information. And the email forum uh, that's been put together, if I saw recently one of the members was looking for recommendations about a painter and got several uh, responses and, and guides. If you're not on there and would like to be on that kind of a forum for sharing um, all sorts of information, then contact Queenie at the office at Emeritus College. Upcoming events, don't try to read all of these. It's just an example of what's there on the web now. There are events every few days, every week, and the list goes on and on week by week and month by month on the calendar there. So please do check that frequently. Many of these events are advertised in the e-news that comes to your email as well, but you can get more information, uh, registration, sign up uh, links as well. Uh, but many things are coming up that are of great importance. Uh, a special photo interest group, the unit reps meeting, a lot of prep is going into that one in early March. And at the next general meeting in April, uh, in addition to our speakers, the members from the poetry group will have a, a book display. So there'll be more information about that. And many of you know that last fall, the uh, Council held a retreat. It seems to be becoming a, a tradition. Looking at our strategic plan, seeing what needs updating, if things need changing, how what progress have been made. And we've uh, presented to the council uh, last week, an update of, of what we've learned from that uh, retreat. We still have the, the main goals, the main areas of emphasis in the, in the plan. But I've put together here just a, a list of things that we're emphasizing with your help in the coming months and year. Certainly facilitating the transition to retirement is a, is a big one. Supporting 
continuing scholarly engagement such as today, supporting community volunteering, supporting healthy aging overall in the programming that the college supports. Providing ways to connect in person here online in large groups like this and small groups, um, and especially across disciplines, bringing people as today who probably never connected with each other when you were working at UBC, but have a chance now to come together on topics of great interest. Uh, the communication plan is, is well underway. There's a new brand you'll see in the various uh, uh, communication tools that are used. We're um, interviewing next week for a, a communication specialist to help us further this, especially to be able to uh, identify our stakeholders and really communicate strategically with them the message about the value of the college. We'll have new space in the Brock Commons 2 uh, building uh, in the summer, in the fall. And it's a chance to rejoice with new space. It'll, it'll provide space for small groups to get together, not a group this size, but it'll be a space for the office staff and a, a campus on location where you can connect with the Emeritus College. And importantly, we have to work on sustaining all our activities. We have to uh, recruit and mentor volunteers to take over from some people who spent all their retirement volunteering and maybe looking for a chance to relax. Um, and we have come to the conclusion that we're going to have to raise funds. It's been on the sort of back burner of the agenda for a couple of years, suggestions that we need to raise funds. Now with the financial situation of the university uh, in the near future and for the next couple of years, it looks quite certain that we're going to have to raise some funds to carry on our own activities. Uh, and we are welcoming those who might be interested in joining a small development fundraising group to uh, start strategizing on how to do this. So if you have a particular interest in that area, please let me or Sandra in the office know. I'm not going to enter into a big discussion of these items right now because we've got uh, a visitor to speak to us. Um, Oh, I do need those pages. <laughs> Murray McCutcheon is with us and will be speaking in a couple of minutes. He earned three degrees in physics at UBC uh, while he was also a, a competitive track athlete, very accomplished in, in many areas. He was selected as a Rhodes Scholar and did a BA in PPE, Polit philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford. And then he had a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard. So he's uh, well experienced in a variety of educational settings. But he's here now as Senior Vice President of Partnering and part of the executive team at Abcelera. And in this role, Murray leads Abcelera's business development, alliance management, and marketing teams. Uh, Abcelera was founded as a startup out of UBC in 2012. It's become a global leader in the discovery and development of new antibody medicines with over 500 employees, sites in three countries, and a portfolio of over 100 antibody drug programs with more than 40 partners. It's a very successful startup, one that UBC is very proud of. More than a few of you or someone you love will have benefited from an antibody medicine. And I'm sure you'll join me in welcoming Murray to tell us about such medicines, how Abcelera has play, been so successful as a company. And he, he likes to, to say how companies play such a critical role in the health of Canadians and the economy of Canada. So welcome, Murray. Just reconnect here. Okay. That's the power. Okay. Fantastic. 
Well, I understand that I'm following in the footsteps of your, your last month's meeting with President Bacon. So uh, clearly an esteemed company here. And I'd just like to say it's a real privilege to come and speak to your group today. I'd like to start by asking you to cast your mind back to just over four years ago. At the time, there were reports coming out of China of a pathogen that had broken out and was leading to uh, clearly a, uh, a, a number of illnesses and deaths uh, that were being reported in the media. Uh, at the time, it seemed like this was uh, potentially just confined to China. Uh, but as January unfolded, it was clear that it, the virus had escaped from China and was circulating the globe. So this is the headline from the New York Times in, on February the 2nd, 2020, uh, that announced that it looks likely that the coronavirus was going to be a pandemic. Now, on January the 20th, the US Center for Disease Control received the first patient sample that had been consented for, uh, for study and confirmed that this was indeed the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The next day, the US government called us at Abcelera and asked, can we help? It's pretty remarkable that a startup out of UBC that at the time was fewer than 100 people was in the first line of defense for emergency response uh, for the chain of command of the US government. Imagine that. So to help you understand how we got to that place, I'd like to wind back and start at the beginning. And the beginning with Abcelera, as it does with so many science-driven companies, starts with the science. This is a picture of an antibody. You have a billion or so circulating in your bloodstream at any given time. Uh, and as I, as I give you some of the fundamentals of the immune system here, I know that this should be pretty familiar terrain because we're all part-time immunologists after weathering COVID-19. So we're all familiar with what antibodies are. Uh, they are Y-shaped proteins. So the two arms that you see at the top of the rendition here uh, are the parts of the molecule that bind to a receptor or a given target in uh, the body and uh, act very specifically to, to bind to that, to that domain, that target. Uh, these antibodies are produced uh, by the immune system as part of what's called the adaptive immune system. So very broadly speaking, we have two components of our immune system. There's the, in, uh, the innate immune system. You can think about this as the first line of defense in responding to any foreign pathogen or infection. Crucially, the innate immune system does not respond specifically to a target or a pathogen. It's more of a broad response, and therefore it doesn't have any memory associated with it. The, a second branch of the immune system we call the adaptive immune system. It takes typically longer to be activated, uh, but it mounts a more specific response to any pathogen or virus, bacteria that might enter the body. There are two main branches of uh, the adaptive immune system. There's the T cell branch on the right side. And one of the heavy hitters in the T cell response are the cytotoxic T cells. These are responsible for uh, killing cells that have been infected. On the other side, we have the B cell responses. So B cells are the main actors in uh, producing antibodies. So the B cells begin their life in your bone marrow. Uh, they uh, then migrate through your lymphoid tissues and uh, they are, once these cells mature, they become what are called plasma cells that secrete antibodies into, uh, into your bloodstream. So uh, these antibodies are uh, one of the foremost defense mechanisms that we have. Uh, to prevent and respond to infection. Now in the life of a B cell, there are 
uh, there, there are the active cells that secrete antibodies and there are memory B cells. And uh, this, the memory B cells are how we sort of store the, the response to a given infection. And uh, therefore, when we see that again over time, we're able to quickly respond to it because we've, the, these cells have been developed and are ready on standby to produce antibodies as part of that response. So when you get vaccinated, uh, vaccination is a way to stimulate the production of antibodies against the protein in, in the, the vaccine, which is intended to train your, your immune system to respond to this virus or this, this given protein and build up that memory, memory compartment, the memory B cells, so that in future when you encounter the real thing, you can respond. B cells are at the heart of, of the Abscellera story. Now, this is a picture of an antibody that is binding to a given receptor. In this case, this is actually the SARS-CoV-2 virus. You, the, the pillars that you see on the purple uh, sphere are uh, renditions of the spike protein on the virus. And you can see here the green antibody is coming in and binding in a very specific place. Uh, this is really a central uh, part of the antibody response is that uh, they've developed very sophisticated mechanisms for uh, this specific binding. In fact, uh, there's a, a well of highly evolved feedback loop within the immune system such that uh, the, the uh, genetic sequence, which codes for those antibodies, gets shuffled and then new antibodies are produced if they bind more effectively, those, that, that essentially builds up an, a feedback loop and those antibodies are expressed more preferentially. The ones that don't bind very well uh, are, uh, are not amplified. And this is a way that the immune response is able to essentially select for the most effective antibodies for a given infection. Now, over the last 20 years or so, antibodies have become a dominant class of medicines. And this is owing to a number of factors. First and foremost, they are exquisitely specific to a given target. It's often said that they bind like a, a lock in a key. So uh, very, very specific to a given biological receptor. Uh, and as a result, that means that they uh, do not bind to other places uh, in, in, uh, that are, would, would potentially produce unwanted side effects. This is very attractive when you're trying to develop a therapeutic. You want it to do one thing and not another. These are also biological molecules. And so they are uh, highly you know, e co-evolved with our, our immune system. Over the last 300 million years or so, all of the jawed vertebrates have uh, this, this uh, um, type of re immune response. And as a result, these are very, uh, safe and developable molecules for making medicines out of. The last factor is they tend to be highly potent. So because of the way the antibodies work in the body, uh, a, a small dose can last for many weeks and typically have a very powerful therapeutic effect. Just to give you a bit of a comparison to the traditional class of medicines, these this slide here shows what a small molecule looks like. So aspirin is a classic example of a small molecule. Uh, it is uh, about 180 Daltons in size. So if you're not familiar with the, the Dalton, uh, I think a, a neutral carbon 12 atom is about 1 12th of a Dalton. So uh, the, 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 it's a handful of atoms that comprise uh, the aspirin molecule. An antibody is about a thousand times larger. So it, you often hear about them referred to as large molecules. You can see here the scale uh, just on a schematic. Uh, they're immensely more complex, uh, vastly more number of, of molecules. They're also, it's crucial to know, they, they need to be produced by living cells. So whereas small molecules like aspirin are produced in chemical reactions and chemical syntheses, Antibodies are produced via cell cultures. 
you, uh, if you think about some of the, the most uh, notable companies in the pharmaceutical industry, say Bayer or Pfizer or Merck, these were all chemical companies, many of them dating from the 1800s, and they honed their craft developing chemicals. And when the, as uh, the understanding of medicine and the development of therapeutics started to advance in the early 1900s, many of them found very viable businesses creating small molecules and using the same kind of science, the same kind of manufacturing capabilities, uh, which are based on chemical engineering. The antibody production is very different, it requires a whole host of different uh, technologies. And ultimately the manufacturing, as I mentioned, has to be done uh, in cell cultures, in vessels that uh, uh, allow those cells to, to multiply and to stably and reliably produce uh, these, these antibodies that can then be uh, purified down and, and ultimately isolated into the medicine. Bit of a historical perspective on therapeutic antibodies. Uh, the first such uh, monoclonal antibody was produced in 1975. So way over on the left of the plot here, uh, this was work by uh, a pair of researchers, Kohler and Milstein, who eventually won the Nobel Prize in 1984 in medicine. Uh, and their, uh, their insight was, uh, solving one of the great challenges in producing antibodies. So if you think about the introduction I gave to, uh, to B cells and how they produce an antibody, every B cell produces a unique or different antibody. And this is, this is key to mounting a, a very diverse and robust immune response to infection. But if you want to hone in on a single antibody and produce that reliably, you need a way to reliably culture a single uh, genetic strain of, of uh, B cells. So the Colstein and, and Mil Miller's trick uh, was to fuse a B cell with a cancer cell into uh, a hybrid known as a hybridoma. And the, the cancer cell immortalized this cell line and kept it able to replicate and reliably reproduce. And it, as a result, they could essentially scale up a cell culture of hybridomas that were producing a single uh, monoclonal antibody. That technology is still used today, in fact, by many of the pharma companies. Uh, and although it was state of the art in 1975, it is no longer state of the art and, and suffers from, from many drawbacks, which uh, I'll get into. But just going through this slide here, uh, some of the, the, the main checkpoints along the way, you'll see uh, on the left, the first antibody that was actually authorized for, for use in patients was to prevent rejection of kidney uh, transplants. So it was essentially blocking the immune response to this foreign tissue that was used uh, uh, when, when a person received a transplanted organ. Many of the subsequent antibodies were used for things like lymphoma. Um, there was uh, uh, colorectal cancer, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, the Crohn's disease. These are many of the major cancers and autoimmune disorders that afflict uh, people are now treated with with monoclonal antibodies. The last one you see in this curve on the right-hand side is a molecule called pembrolizumab, uh, which is the trade name is Keytruda. And this has become uh, one of the uh, core uh, drugs to respond to cancer. And it's a type of cancer uh, treatment called immunotherapies. So the idea behind immunotherapy is that uh, cancer, cancerous cells have developed very sophisticated ways to evade the natural mechanisms of the immune system to, to respond and remove these aberrant cells. So they essentially are able to uh, replicate and multiply uh, underneath the radar of the immune system. And the idea behind immunotherapy is, is uh, it's also called checkpoint inhibition, is to remove these, these uh, mechanisms, these 
guardrails that the cancer cells put up to escape the, the detection of the immune system and basically make the cancer visible to the immune system so the body's natural defenses can fight it off. So this cancer is a heterogeneous disease. There are uh, many uh, variants and it's uh, highly heterogeneous across, across individuals. So this is not a one size fits all therapy, but it has proven transformative for uh, many, many different types of cancers and continues to grow uh, and, and be applied to, to different areas. So ultimately what you see here is essentially an exponential rise in the adoption and use of monoclonal antibodies to treat disease. And the, the market projection, projections for this for 2025 is about $300 billion uh, annually that uh, are, are um, uh, essentially the market sales for the use of these types of therapies. So needless to say, it is a very, very important class of medicines and has uh, been transformative for many types of disease. So with that background, let me give you uh, an introduction to Abcellera in the early days. So you see here a picture of, a uh, slightly blurry picture uh, of Carl Hansen uh, sitting on the right side with two of his grad students, Véronique Lecaux and Kevin Arias. This was about 10 years ago. Uh, and at the time, they'd been developing a suite of technologies. Uh, Carl was a professor in the physics department, uh, also had a joint appointment in the Michael Smith labs, and had been working on a class of technologies known as microfluidics. So microfluidics are uh, a way of manipulating small volumes of liquids and uh, controlling, controlling them in tiny reaction vessels so that you can run experiments on in a, in a very uh, what we'd call high throughput and miniaturized fashion. Uh, at the time, they realized that they built up all these capabilities and they had a, a wonderful team of PhD students and postdocs and people were sort of looking for their next step. What were they going to do? And uh, I think Veronique had applied for a postdoc somewhere uh, in the US. Kevin was thinking of, of leaving and starting something. And one day they got together and said, hey, we've got a great team here and we've, got, we've done some great science. We've built up some great capabilities. We think this could be applied to the problem of how to discover monoclonal antibodies. Uh, the, the technologies for that were grounded in science that was done in the 1970s and 1980s. It's a very difficult problem to, uh, to isolate single cells and to uh, to screen for the antibodies that they produce, maybe our microfluidic capabilities could be applied to this. So they decided to start a company. Uh, and I thought I would just highlight a few of the key themes, which uh, in hindsight have been instrumental in the success of the company. The first uh, is having a technology advantage. And so there's actually a, a robust literature on how new technologies are developed and adopted into established industries. And it, very often at the beginning, these technologies are, are not particularly mature, uh, but they do something in a fundamentally different way that just uh, has a disruptive or order of magnitude change and improvement on an existing way of doing things. And that is really key to getting a technology startup off the ground is to have a technology advantage over the existing way of doing things. Part of that is being able to protect that, uh, that advantage and exclude others from doing the same thing and copying you at least for a time. And that's where uh, I, the concept of IP and intellectual property comes in uh, through UBC and the UILO, the University Industrial Liaison Office. Um, Carl had been very proactive in filing patents and um, the UILO is, uh, is actually a, a, one, a treasure of the university. Uh, if I could opine for a minute, uh, woefully underfunded. Uh, it really deserves more resources and has been uh, punching well above its weight in, in Canada and North America for, for many years. So um, that was uh, key to being able to protect some of the early advantages and, and technologies that were developed. 
The second thing is it's really important to have a, a large market to address. Uh, there, there needs to be uh, a large and growing market gives you ample opportunity to find a niche, sort of a toehold into uh, this established industry and to develop and grow uh, your own line of business. The third one, capital efficiency. It's really hard to get a new organization off the ground and to build a team, to uh, establish facilities, to bring in revenue. And uh, it's often very, um, it's necessary to bootstrap or, or uh, economize in the early days. And one of the things that uh, was key to Abcellera's success was being able to incubate at the university for several years. Many of the grants that were brought in to fund the research at the Michael Smith Labs and in Carl's lab were explicitly translational in nature. So these were grants from the likes of NSERC and uh, uh, CIHR that essentially uh, were, were directed towards developing applications of the science and uh, developing IP and ultimately to, to try to lead to job creation. So this, this idea of incubating a new organization, a new company uh, within the, the sort of protective confines of a university, being able to access all the shared facilities, uh, being able to um, use grad students pursuing research that was also applied to the company. Uh, this is actually a very efficient way to weather those difficult early years when you're, when you're trying to get off the ground. I know from experience, having spent several you're almost a decade south of the border in the US. If Abcellera had been started at say Harvard where, where I did my postdoc and worked in their technology licensing office, within a year we would have been, had to leave the university and been forced to sort of find our own, uh, our own facilities and funding independent of the university. And there's a very bright line drawn between the research activities and any, any uh, sort of hint of commercialization. Uh, that puts you on a very different trajectory because now you're out raising money from venture capitalists who end up owning the company and trying to develop a quick win that uh, often leads to uh, uh, not a full development of the potential. So this was, this was really key to what we were able to do here at UBC. The fourth thing, the partnering business model. So uh, in the biotech industry, a lot of companies are started to try to develop a new therapy, a new drug. This uh, is an extremely challenging endeavor and it's almost a binary outcome. The odds are against you. If, if you succeed, uh, it, it can uh, lead to, lead to uh, um, essentially expansion and growth of your company, but tip, more often than not, it fails and the, there's, there's not a lot of other options to pursue. In Abcellera's case, what we did was focus on building enabling technologies. So I, I referred to the microfluidics earlier. The idea was to uh, build on that initial advantage and build a suite of capabilities that could be applied to discovering antibodies for, uh, for partners. And so we worked in a partnership mode and we still do with many of the many partners in the industry where we're finding, we're using our technology to find antibodies that then they develop into drugs and ultimately commercialize. And as a result, we can be spreading our bets. We're not focused on uh, a single program that is uh, uh, potentially at, at risk of failure. Uh, we can spread our bets, bring in some revenue, getting paid for the work, and also command a, a small stake or share in the future success of those drugs and build up a, what's called a royalty portfolio on, uh, on those programs. So this partnering business model was a way to mitigate the risk or, uh, of, of building a company in such a difficult sector and, and grow in a, a sort of sustained and systematic way. And the last is, uh, although it's the final point here, it's certainly not the least, is what is, I would describe as a team first approach. This is absolutely critical to uh, any, any mission that, that you join. It's, it really is a, uh, you, when, you're, when you're trying to, to uh, build something, uh, it's, these are audacious goals. It's extremely challenging. It's very important that everyone 
is on board and working to achieve a common goal. And that requires a team-based mentality uh, um, uh, uh, rather than uh, cultivating sort of an individual uh, or egocentric sort of mentality. So this has, has been something that in the early days was sort of core to the team. It's one of the reasons that in 2016, when I was looking to bring back or bring back my family from the US and, and uh, relocate to Canada and, and try to build something here, I met the founding team and was really struck by uh, the, the bond they had together and the kind of shared sense of purpose and desire to try to build a lasting and impactful company here in Canada. So a little bit more about the, the technology that we developed at Abcellera. The as I mentioned earlier, we have about a billion different antibodies circulating at any one time in our bodies. We actually have the capacity to make orders of magnitude more, uh, depending on uh, the, the, uh, if we were exposed to infections or other pathogens, uh, each of these antibodies is derived from a single B cell. So if you're trying to sort, sift through this vast, what we call a repertoire or library of antibodies to find the ones that have the right properties for binding to a given target, and uh, uh, this, this is really a single cell problem. And so trying to access this natu natural immune diversity is, uh, is benefits from technologies that are predicated on uh, studying single cells. We have a saying that small is sensitive. So to give you a, an illustration of how this works, a single B cell secretes about a thousand antibodies every second. It's actually remarkable that a cell could develop the, the protein uh, machinery to secrete that many molecules on an ongoing basis. But nevertheless, if you use a conventional uh, tool in a biology lab, this is a 96 well plate, the, the size of the wells on that plate, it's about hundred microliters, it would take roughly two years to achieve a concentration of antibody sufficient to detect. Clearly in that time, that B cell would be long dead and, uh, uh, and the, it's not uh, a, a reasonable time frame to conduct an experiment on. However, if you shrink that volume down to one nanoliter, so now we're talking about five orders of magnitude smaller, the time to reach a detectable concentration of antibody is a matter of minutes. So that is really the, the fundamental insight that uh, allows us to study single cells and the antibodies produced from them in a very tractable amount of time and in a high throughput way. So here's a picture of one of the devices that we use for this study. You can see here an immune cell in the lower right corner. So this is a B cell uh, that is continuously secreting antibodies. Uh, we, alongside the immune cell are a number of beads. These beads are optically encoded and coated with the antigen or the target of interest, such that if an antibody binds to that target, it will light up, it'll produce a fluorescent signal, and that's detectable in a microscope. You can be uh, clever with these kind of uh, experiments, we call them assays. And if you use multiple different types of beads, you can uh, do more, uh, more complicated kinds of experiments and test, for example, does the antibody bind to this target and not to this target? So you see that by getting an optical signal on one type of bead and not on the other type of bead. So bear in mind, these chambers here are one nanoliter in size. So they're, they're just a few, about 10 microns uh, in, in their, uh, uh, a given the side length of the chamber. Uh, and we have about uh, hundreds of thousands of these integrated onto a single device. It's about the size of a credit card. And uh, as a result, you can perform essentially uh, 100,000 or in some of the larger chips have many times that number of, of chambers, experiments in parallel at the same time. So we load these B cells, these immune cells, 
uh, into the chambers via microfluidic technologies. And then the, the, uh, as the experiment is run using uh, computer vision uh, and uh, some, uh, the, the hardware that we've built and the software tools, we can essentially sift through those hundreds of thousands of images in essentially real time and identify which are the antibodies of interest for further study. So this, this is really the, the step change or uh, a, 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 key, a key hurdle at the time, 10 years ago, that allowed us to uh, build up um, the, the business from the early days. So over time, we've been trying to tackle uh, problems in drug development using this technology. And you'll see a, written on the title here that uh, going from a target idea to testing a drug in the clinic or clinical development is uh, one of the most complex and technologically intensive paths in any sector. So this, uh, it, it is not hubris uh, to, to make this assertion. Drug discovery, it takes, it takes typically five or six years uh, to, to get to a point where you could launch a clinical trial. That's on the right-hand side. And that clini the clinical trials typically take seven to 10 years to prove out that a drug is safe, uh, it's effective, and it beats the standard of care in the, for, for a given disease. So uh, all told, uh, this is uh, not for the faint of heart. So what, what I'm showing you here is a typical uh, uh, develop, um, investment profile for a therapeutic drug. So on the left-hand side is the start of a program, say at year one. And for the first 12 years, there's nothing but investment. So the, the, bar, the bars are below the line because you're spending money. And the investment gets higher uh, as the closer you get to uh, the end of clinical trials because the large phase three trials typically take, you need to test in thousands of patients at multiple hospital centers across the country or even sometimes globally. So on average, a given drug program takes about a billion dollars of investment. It takes more than 10 years, typically 12 years, to, uh, sometimes longer, to get even to the point where you're generating any revenue. So it's been approved for use and uh, now commercial sales can happen. And the odds of getting to that are about 5%. So 19 out of 20 drug programs that are initiated fail. So this is, uh, uh, this is a, a difficult sector to, to gain traction in. Uh, and being technologists, what we focused on is the, the initial years where uh, I, you can see by the green square here, this is the most technology intensive time. It's really when you're trying to discover a molecule that has the right properties. We don't claim to be able to do anything better in the clinical trials. That's human biology. It's uh, essentially letting, letting uh, nature and take its course uh, as we test out the effect of a given therapy. But in the early years, this, in this technology intensive arena, this is where having the best technology can shorten the time to achieve success. It can uh, increase the odds of success. So raise the probability from 5%, say to 10% would be a massive improvement uh, and ultimately um, lead to, to uh, um, essentially the, 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 the success of the program. So this is, the, this is where we focus our efforts. And as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've done this by working in a partnership manner. So many of our partners are uh, some of the most familiar names in the industry the likes of uh, Lilly, Moderna, uh, uh, you'll recognize Pfizer. Uh, these are companies that are very enabled and have a lot of capabilities of their own, but they, they'll come to us to, uh, to take advantage of our technology uh, in those early years so that we can find, find some of the antibodies that they're unable to, to, uh, um, to identify. And then we'll pass them back to them for the clinical development and ultimately for the, the commercialization. So in this way, our business has been able to grow by 
uh, getting research payments. So we're paid for the work that we do. And then we take a small stake in the future success of those programs. Coming back now to 2020, uh, how did we get in that position? In 2017, Absalera won a $30 million contract from DARPA to build a pandemic prevention capability. Now, if you're not familiar with DARPA, this is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency of the US Department of Defense. And they work on many of the high risk, high reward uh, efforts uh, within, um, within the department. At the, um, you, you may know that the internet emerged from what, what was originally the ARPANET, first established in 1969 and was where the TCP IP protocol was first used in, in, uh, for networking. Uh, the GPS emerged from DARPA. So it's really been quite a, a successful organization over the years. And they decided in 2017 that the risk of a pandemic was, was high and that we needed to invest in more technologies to be able to respond to this. It was an audacious goal that 60 days after the identification of uh, a pathogen, the, 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 the capability would be capable of uh, delivering uh, countermeasures into the field to prevent, essentially act as a firebreak to prevent the further spread of that pathogen. So essentially compressing drug development from 10 plus years down to 60 days. Uh, definitely a moonshot, uh, but uh, by aiming for these really uh, seemingly outrageous goals, it forces outside the box thinking and, and trying things in different ways. And that was something that we had built up uh, uh, a, a reputation for being able to solve problems that others hadn't and led, led to this uh, prime contract from DARPA. And we spent the next two years uh, essentially building up this toolkit and performing successfully on a number of trial, trial uh, um, outbreaks. We did a, a capability demonstration in 2018 uh, against the flu virus that uh, just in a, in a very uh, um, sort of lab-based setting that showed that we were able to, um, to, to perform to the standards uh, of the program. So that led us to uh, January 2020, getting the call from DARPA for the first patient sample that had been identified uh, in, in North America. And what we did was after receiving that, that sample, uh, in the first three days, we used our, our teams and our technology to screen for antibodies that were in the, in the blood sample. Uh, we screened almost 6 million B cells that were in the sample. And out of that, we identified over the course of the next 24 days or so, uh, uh, about 20, um, uh, 20, 23, 24 leads. So these are individual antibodies that had potential to be neutralizing for the virus. Uh, so that was, a, needless to say, an intense period, three weeks of all hands on deck work. Uh, and we were then forged a partnership with Eli Lilly, uh, one of the major pharma companies who was able to rapidly move that antibody into larger scale manufacturing. And 90 days later, on May 1st, the first clinical trial started uh, in human patients. So 90 days to clinical trials in what arguably was the most competitive drug discovery program ever. Uh, every company in the world who had any angle on trying to develop a therapeutic or a vaccine was trying to do so. So uh, we were very proud to be at the front of the pack and have that antibody uh, ultimately authorized by the, the FDA in the US for, for treatment of COVID-19 patients. That was in November, 2020. That antibody was called Bamlanivimab or BAM for short. So it's a, a bit of a mouthful but it's a technical name. Uh, it was authorized by Health Canada about a week later. Uh, over the course of the pandemic, of course, the virus was continually evolving. And so it was necessary to continue to screen and monitor uh, patient samples and try to essentially keep up 
with the, the evolution of the virus. Uh, as a result, we were able to bring forth a second antibody uh, called Bebtilovimab. This was authorized in February of 2022. Uh, it was the most potent therapeutic antibody that was found uh, against SARS-CoV-2, and it was more broadly effective. So it was really uh, able to neutralize a number of the different variants, Omicron uh, being um, the notable one at the time. So together, these two antibodies treated about two and a half million patients, mostly in the US. Uh, and if you look at the clinical trial data, you can sort of back out the, the, the numbers that roughly one in eight or one in 10 of those patients would have been admitted to hospital for, for uh, the um, uh, you know, serious complications of COVID-19. And about one in 50 uh, would have passed away. So the, the uh, hundreds of thousands of lives were, were um, or uh, people were kept out of hospital and tens of thousands of lives saved from these efforts. Uh, ultimately, this was um, uh, a therapy. So this is treating people who were sick. And um, you know, the, the, this gave time for the vaccine efforts that were uh, typically take longer uh, to, to come online. And ultimately that was the, the, um, that has been the, the major factor in, in, uh, arresting the pandemic. Um, but, uh, to, to play this, to play this role was certainly, uh, a moment we're very proud of at Abcelera and, uh, a real proof point of how, uh, you know, new technologies and new capabilities can, can, um, make a difference. So in the last part of my talk, I just want to uh, speak a little bit about what lies ahead and building an anchor company here in Vancouver and in Canada. Most of our 10, 11 years as a company has been focused on building all of the different tools and capabilities to discover uh, antibodies and identify one, uh, you know, a single high potential lead that could be put into clinical trials. Now, the last step before you, you do a clinical trial, you need to manufacture these antibodies. And uh, we were able to forge a partnership with the federal government two years ago to uh, jointly invest and build a manufacturing facility. We are, uh, this has now been, uh, the, the core and shell of the building have been completed. It's in False Creek Flats down by the new St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. And it will be capable of producing uh, sufficient antibodies to support a phase one clinical trial and potentially a phase two clinical trial. So it's not a commercial size facility. It wouldn't be able to produce uh, enough um, of a, a medicine to treat uh, a, a common, you, you know, a commonly app an approved uh, therapy. But to run the trials is it's very important to be able to produce and manufacture uh, those antibodies. So this is sort of the final step in our journey to be able to build a complete toolkit to go from what is essentially an idea for, for a new medicine through to uh, uh, running a clinical trial. The company, we're, we call ourselves Abcellarites. Uh, so we're, we're just shy of 600 people uh, and we're located in, in three countries. So headquarters is here in Vancouver and we have offices uh, in Mount Pleasant. We're moving into a new lab at 4th and Columbia in the coming months and the manufacturing facility just a few kilometers away, as I mentioned. We have a small team in Montreal. Uh, we have about 20 researchers in Boston where we acquired a company a couple of years ago. And we also have a research team in Sydney, Australia of about 50 people. When, so I, I count myself as a patriot. Uh, I've made a choice to come back to Canada and build my career here, move my family here and return to a university where I was trained and uh, um, uh, had uh, essentially my formative experiences. It's, uh, it's been apparent to me that, that uh, in order to advance our capabilities in uh, commercializing new science, in uh, building up technology companies, we have to be able to scale our, our startups. We have to be able to grow uh, from the seed stage uh, opportunities we have into large large companies that are capable of running a sustained business. And in biotech, if you look at the data, uh, Canada is actually uh, highly innovative. We create 
IP with the, the best of uh, our peer nations. There's uh, world-class science happening here at UBC and at many universities across the country. And we start a lot of companies that uh, are, are based on great, those, that great science and those great ideas. What happens is typically those companies get to 10 or 20 or 30 people and uh, they are not able to, to take the next step. And very often what happens is they go south of the border. Um, the people leave, the intellectual property leaves, the clinical trials are run elsewhere. And ultimately the value from those early ideas is, is not retained and, and captured in Canada. So we call this in, in um, the drug development arena, this infrastructure gap. So we, the, you see on the left-hand side here, target discovery. This is the kind of science that happens in the medical research labs on campus, trying to identify new disease mechanisms and uh, that might be treatable by, by a, a therapeutic. Antibody discovery is companies like Abcelera uh, that are able to, to uh, find these molecules at the lab scale. But when it comes to actually testing, doing the scale up and clinical manufacturing and ultimately running clinical trials, we don't have that capacity uh, in, in the country. It, it, most of the pharmaceutical industry that was in Quebec in the 80s and 90s, uh, those research labs have left. And uh, this, this activity doesn't happen here. Uh, I'm reminded of a quote that uh, actually a professor at UBC, um, uh, Andre Marziali, he runs the engineering physics program. So he, he came out and spoke at a public hearing that we had with the city of Vancouver, where we were trying to get approval to build our new lab facility in Mount Pleasant. What he said was that he used to tell his students who were graduating that to, to take the next step in their career, they needed to go to one of the hubs, one of the hotbeds of innovation. So go to the Bay Area, go to Boston. That's where, that's where you're going to advance your career. And he said, you know, he doesn't say that anymore. He says, look at, look at a company like Abcelera that's doing you know, great work here locally. You're, they're a science-driven company that uh, creates opportunities and was a wonderful place to start your career. So that was very inspiring for me to hear. Uh, and we need to do more of this. Um, so one, one, of our, one of our missions is to try to scale up our capabilities and to uh, not only to be discovering some of these breakthrough therapeutics here, but to ensure that they're actually manufactured here, the IP is retained here, and ultimately in future, if these are successful in their commercial sales, the benefits of that are, are flowing back into, uh, into Canada. Um, it's, uh, th this slide gives a picture of the challenges. So we are the only country in the G7 without a major pharmaceutical company. Um, the Canadian companies, and there are many innovative uh, local companies, they're more than twice as likely to run their clinical trials in the US at some of the major centers. In, in fact, it's a rational choice to go to the Mass General or to Fred Hutch or to uh, um, MD Anderson to run a clinical trial because there's a robust ecosystem, the networks of physicians, they're used to, used to this kind of activity. Uh, there's a, a bit of a chicken and egg problem there that we need to get over. Uh, and lastly, the, if you just look purely economically, we run a massive trade deficit in pharma because we buy all our drugs from outside the country. So in order to tip the balance here, it's essential to actually uh, scale up and retain this IP and to build anchor companies. So this was really the, the, the thesis behind a partnership that we were able to strike last year with the governments of BC and the government of Canada to try to uh, address this gap. And, you know, we're very excited to be uh, embarking on an eight-year project that is actually to the tune of about $700 million. Abcelera is uh, providing more than 50% of that. And the, the federal government through the SIF program, a strategic innovation fund, is contributing about $220 million, And the BC government is contributing $75 million. And the idea is to build, uh, first of all, sort of fortify our infrastructure here. So we actually have the labs and the, the, uh, the, the facilities required to do this work. And then to launch uh, up to 17 new drug programs, drug development programs that we will commit to advancing in the clinical 
research ecosystem in Canada. So the likes of the new St. Paul's Hospital that's going into uh, down at False Creek Flats, they're building a clinical trials unit. They're hungry for opportunities to, to have a company that uh, would bring in uh, one of their one of their programs to run a phase one clinical trial. So we're we're now lining up the pieces to ensure that uh, some of the programs that we're actively working on will be advanced further in the country and ultimately build this this sort of know how this expertise the, these networks that are so critical to uh, to doing this on a repeatable and sustained basis and building up this ecosystem uh, in the country. So closing slide, uh, it's, uh, you know, where does Abcellera stand now? Uh, we, are, we consider ourselves a drug development company. We're, our roots were in technology and building capabilities. We're now applying those capabilities to develop programs of our own and to build a pipeline of therapeutic antibodies. Uh, we have a number of different programs that we're focused on now, and we anticipate taking those into clinical trials over the coming years. We also continue to focus on strategic partnerships. I mentioned earlier the, the number of companies that we've worked with uh, historically, and uh, this is an active area that's part of my role at the company is to continue to seek out those partnerships to, uh, to combine, combine uh, capabilities of companies, combine the scientific prowess of both, both, uh, both partners and ultimately try to develop uh, therapies that, that make an impact, make a difference. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll close and uh, thank, you. thank you everyone. I'd be happy to take questions. Question, yes. We have microphones that will circulate, be heard. Thanks, Herb. Uh, thank you for a very inspiring talk. Uh, my question is about this test. Is that working? I'm not sure if it's working or not. <laughs> um, my impression from your talk was that the existence of DARPA in the US was a key factor in your move, your needing to move initially into the US. And I wonder if it's the lack of something like DARPA in Canada, which, uh, which would be a key factor in, in moving that kind of capability to Canada. Thanks for your question. I, if you, people didn't hear it, uh, the question was about uh, whether uh, there's an opportunity, an unmet need for a DARPA-like organization in Canada. And just to be clear, Abcellera is, is firmly rooted in Canada. Uh, we're growing the company here. Uh, it's actually remarkable that a U.S. government funding organization would uh, essentially be agnostic to uh, the border and be, be uh, uh, committing to a, um, a program led by a Canadian company. It was not an issue. Uh, for 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 them, uh, they it is it is actually remarkable their approach at DARPA. It really is mission driven. It's very program centric, and uh, it's a very nimble sort of mechanism. Where um, I think it's the opposite of what you might see in a bureaucratic uh, sort of sclerotic process, uh, driven by endless reviews and sort of committees. It is uh, very, very, um, uh, I, I think, a, a tightly managed program with a single program leaders who assemble small teams and work uh, tirelessly on, on, on problems that achieve a given or are directed towards a given problem, a given uh, um, area. So other countries have tried to, uh, or have, there's a lot of talk about replicating that. And I, I know the UK, is, uh, is, is trying to do similar things. Um, there's, I, I, I can't speak to what's happening in, in, uh, in the Canadian government circles other than to say it, it, it definitely uh, is a high impact organization that has had a great returns in terms of achieving um, uh, breakthrough technologies in various areas. So uh, I think there's a lot, to, a lot to learn from that. And um, uh, we would, 
you know, we would be big proponents of seeing something like that here north of the border. Oh, thanks. Oh, um, sorry. So I have a question for you. And I, I recognize that this is a highly competitive industry. And I'm very impressed with uh, what you've described as your process. But what I'm wondering is whether you have considered, uh, aside from the strategic partnerships you're forming, uh, putting out some kind of a model for some of the other startup companies in Canada so that they had some insights into that have been gleaned from your experience into how they could replicate the kind of process that you've developed. Thanks. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there's a research group at the business school at SFU that uh, has put out a publication uh, I believe it was in the Nature Medicine Journal that um, essentially analyzed the Abcellera model, the uh, business model, and uh, um, wrote a publication on some of the key the key attributes of it. So I would say um, there there has been some attention to that. Uh, we're we do feel part of a community uh, in Canada, and there are it's uh, relatively tightly knit. Uh, there there are conferences that. Um, you, you, we attend and we'll see a lot of the young up and coming companies. And uh, I'd say there, we have a mentality and, and we see this shared in Canada for trying to, trying to help each other, uh, learn from each other and, and to advance. So um, that, uh, that kind of mentoring and, and uh, um, sharing, sharing, you know, our success stories and, and, insights with others is something that I think is, is really important. We certainly, uh, to some extent, benefited from it, although I'd be remiss not to say in the early days, uh, there were more naysayers than, than uh, backers for what we were doing. And in fact, if you talk to uh, that small team that emerged out of the lab, uh, as they were putting forth their first business plan uh, and entering some of the local business plan competitions and testing their ideas, the consistent refrain was, you can't do this here. There's not enough money. There's not enough people. Uh, you'll never be able, the business model won't work. Uh, you should, you know, go south. That, that was sort of a, a constant narrative. So that's pretty sobering when you, when you think that that's, uh, that's the kind of advice that, that was being given. Now, it wasn't exclusive. There were certainly some people who, who uh, were... Saw, saw the opportunity and said, encourage the team to go after it and say, aim higher. Don't, you know, uh, you, you uh, set your sights high and uh, really work together and try to achieve goals that you don't think are possible. It, there, that, that is, I think, what resonated with the team and what we've, we've tried to do as a company. And um, ultimately, uh, I would like to see, having spent almost 10 years in the US, what I often see is a uh, in Canada is is not enough of that entrepreneurial mindset and a, a can do spirit of uh, you know we can we can rank with the best in the world we can compete we can build things here and we you know we can we can solve tough tra challenges so um, if there's one thing that I would try to spread as a message it would be that so talking to you know some of the students and graduates and younger companies it's uh, is have conviction and uh, you know stay the course and work on hard problems and uh, you know, if, if failure in some sense in the U S failure is a badge of honor. You tried something that didn't work. Uh, you know, try again, let's, let's try something new. And that's, that's the kind of spirit we try to adhere to at Abseller. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a great uh, presentation. Uh, if you discovered a drug today, virtually everybody in this room wouldn't benefit, wouldn't have the opportunity to benefit from it. And I wonder if the clinical trial is, is going to be outdated at some point and the, indiv the prediction of individual personal benefit um, and N of one studies may ultimately replace clinical trials. I wonder what you think about that. It's a, a fascinating question and uh, I'm certainly not an authority on the subject. Uh, there's no question that uh, that diseases such as cancer are highly individual. Uh, and I, I alluded to the fact there's no one-size-fits-all therapy. Um, the, 
I know that there are proponents of, uh, um, and, and certainly with advances in genetic medicine uh, and uh, genetic understanding, there is the opportunity to think about how to tailor medicines for individuals. We're seeing that a little bit with cell therapies where uh, in, in sort of the, the, um, the, the, the general example, uh, you extract the T cells from uh, a person's body, you re-engineer them to have the right genetic properties to, to fight their specific cancer, and then you re-inject them back into the person. Um, those, those are uh, very difficult endeavors, uh, take a long time. The manufacturing is extremely complex. So ultimately, uh, the, the possibility would really be uh, being able to deliver some sort of genetic uh, medicine um, that uh, was could be incorporated into the genome and be be have have the action required. And I think that's the moment. It's a it's a um, a dream. Uh, how to prove that it's safe and effective and and uh, um, you know better than the alternative is uh, something that. Um, is obviously the regulators will need to come to grips with, and it's not clear how uh, how that will happen. <laughs> I think it's a long way off. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, and thank you to you and your company for advancing therapeutics. Um, I have a question about um, access and, and generalizability uh, of these kinds of treatments. Uh, you mentioned, oh, sorry, you mentioned that um, most of the uh, users of your drug uh, when it was available were in the United States. My question is, how are, and I recognize that there's many players in this business, not just the, de the developers yourselves. Uh, my question is, how are you and your partners ensuring that these drugs will be tested in all populations at risk, including marginalized people and people in low and middle income countries, and then, if found effective, will be made accessible and affordable to mm. these people. It, it is uh, certainly, certainly a, a complex issue. And uh, one of the challenges is that uh, the, you know, the next generation of uh, drugs, are, are there, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult to make inroads into some of the most intractable problems. So if we think about neurodegeneration, for example, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, these are, these are uh, you know, I've heard it said it's easier, it would be easier to get to Mars with a billion dollars than to, you know, uh, try to develop a, a therapeutic for one of these conditions. So there are tens of thousands of scientists working on these problems and uh, failing most of the time. So I think it, it really is a little bit of a societal question is how do we, how do we um, ensure that there's sufficient investment and in the foundational research that needs to be done to develop these therapies uh, in a way that um, ensures that, you know, when there is one that comes through, it is, uh, it is uh, not, it doesn't have to be priced to account for all of the other failures in the industry. Because a, a lot of the companies that are doing this work are, uh, um, they are ultimately getting, uh, uh, because 19 out of 20 of their programs fail, when one succeeds, it, it needs to sort of account for, for all of the others that didn't. So, um, I do think too that the pharmaceutical industry is a little bit of a, a convenient um, punching bag in terms of healthcare spending. Uh, it, it gets a lot of negative press. In fact, I think it's uh, in, in the US, the budget, the overall healthcare budget, about 12% is, is spent on pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so the majority of it is of course hospitals and all of the advanced care that's required. Uh, there is inefficiency across the system and how to make that entire healthcare system accessible to uh, patients in need, to populations in need, is is a question, uh, and you know that that is a broader question, uh, as well as trying to find, you know, if if a therapy is is un, is discovered, how can the company that developed it or the organization that developed it recoup sufficient um, returns from that, uh, uh, and balance that against equitable access? So. Um, I don't have an answer. Uh, I think it, uh, it does require a little bit of a different 
model for um, for uh, the at the front end of research um, and the kind of investment and activities that happen in research. What we're seeing, just to give you an example, right now, uh, because of high inflation and the challenges in the macroeconomic arena, there's been a huge exodus of money from uh, from the, the tech sector and biotech in particular. So many fewer companies are getting started. Many companies that have existing uh, businesses are sort of hunkering down and trying to just conserve resources for what they do have in place. And they're not starting those new experimental programs that might one day uh, you know, yield, yield a breakthrough. So that, that is not, we're gonna see the negative impacts of that 10 years from now when uh, there are, there are you know, fewer, fewer uh, new breakthroughs happening because there's been a big drop off in investment now. So I guess um, long story short is it is, it is not a specific uh, challenge. It is a challenge for you know, the drug development industry. It's also a challenge more broadly for the healthcare industry is how do we create a sustainable uh, and cost-effective model that doesn't uh, bankrupt society. And uh, that does require a little bit of a reckoning. Be, reckoning uh, and I think we're, we're sort of trying to, trying to wrestle with that right now in, in BC and in Canada. I don't, I don't have the answers, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly, as we look forward with aging populations and, uh, um, you know, uh, people living longer with chronic conditions, it's, uh, it's a major challenge. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my question is, I'm moving away from the science of antibodies, which I really appreciated your presentation, having started in science, but that's not my question right now. You referred as one of the variables of your... One of the variables of your success, if I heard it right, was the team that you came back to, the team, uh, you know, in, in organizations and corporations, how the team works together, not competes together. And you talk about the American culture and the Canadian culture. And I just wanted to know if, could you just comment, what was it about the team and this company that in part drew you back that was unique and appealing to you around decision-making that often... Hmm doesn't happen when they're competitive and they implode. Do you understand what I'm asking? I, I do. Let me, let me try to reiterate your question. So uh, team was a key factor in, in the early days as it is now. It was attractive to me. Uh, there was, there was a, uh, some critical attributes in the team. Uh, could I, uh, can I articulate what um, the how, how uh, th uh, factors such as decision-making were, um, 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 I guess, manifested in, in that team. So for me, what I, what I see in a team-first environment like we try to cultivate is, first of all, trust is at the core of it, uh, being able to um, really trust the people you work with to do great work and uh, to, to um, uh, uh, part of that is delegation is uh, that decision-making can be ultimately um, can be done nimbly. Um, you know, key, key decisions, uh, you, one does need a mechanism. So we do have governance structures. We come together uh, and uh, have a, a system for making decisions, but uh, there, it's really important that um, to avoid you know, cultures where there's micromanagement, that uh, the upper, upper managers need to be involved in everything. It, it's very important. We're actually quite a young company where the median age is about 27 or 28. So most people are just out of grad school, starting their careers. Uh, it's it's um, crucial that they have the room to grow and develop as scientists and as uh, in the early parts of their career uh, and are given sort of appropriate boundaries to, to uh to, to flourish. So I think uh, so those are some of the key factors, trust, delegation, uh, you know, um, avoiding unnecessary bureaucracy and being able to move nimbly on and mobilize behind important problems. Thank you very much for a stimulating presentation. I wanna ask why does Stanford University seem to be much more successful? Why is Stanford University? Oh, okay. Why is Stanford University so much seemingly so much more successful with startups mm. than other universities? 
I think one of the uh, very often these kind of ecosystems, uh, they're, they're network effects and they're, there are a few factors in a network. You need enough nodes in the network and enough different um, uh, elements that bring together complementary capabilities. And you need a critical mass of activity that sort of sustains that network. Uh, if you look back at the 1950s and 60s, the, the dawn of the Silicon Age, all of the foundational companies emerged from Silicon Valley. You think about Fairchild Semiconductor and uh, and Intel and the, the many iconic companies, uh, there was a confluence of you know, great research happening at the universities. There were, you know, the, the, the venture capital model was pioneered there. Uh, so the early investors that, that essentially invented this, this, uh, this new way of funding technology companies and the entrepreneurial spirit that founded those companies, I think that, that uh, essentially grew into a, a positive feedback loop and people saw that and wanted to replicate it and emulate it and it grew and expanded. So uh, I think the success you see in Stanford now is dates back to those sort of founding conditions. And it is, has uh, now it's become a magnet for people who are interested in um, this intersection of science and commercialization um, for investors seeking opportunities to, to find the next great thing. So there's uh, there's a threshold and a critical mass that's achieved. Um, I think one that's you know maybe taking your question back to what I what I see as the potential here in BC is th there is actually a critical mass of of companies. Abseller is uh, certainly not the only one locally. There's a a number of companies from Zymeworks to Xenon to Stem Cell, which is now more than two thousand employees. Uh, doing great science and building great businesses. And what we need to do is figure out how to, how to build on that critical mass and build the connections with university. So I see the, um, there's a, uh, a new, what's called a, um, a bio hub that's been set up at UBC. Abseller is actually uh, working to support or to, uh, to engage in some of that research with departments here at the university. Uh, that kind of intersection of research, of uh, some of the commercialization, and ultimately, if that's successful, we will see you know, investors uh, wanting to participate and be part of this as well. Uh, so it's early days, but it's, a, it's having a mindset that this is a long game. There's a giant opportunity to build, uh, um, uh, a, 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 uh, to, to build on, to build up an ecosystem in, in biotechnology and technology more generally in, in BC, but it, it does require that, that sort of mindset of, uh, of, of collaboration and of uh, sort of can-do entrepreneurial spirit. Thank you very much, Bert. Uh, I found this very encouraging story about how research at UBC could actually, given the right environment, uh, have a great effect positive effect out, it, out there. Sobering story as well about the challenges, but I think very encouraging. And um, as a visitor, <laughs> we have a tradition of a, of a UBC gift. Thank you very much. Thank you again for coming and sharing <laughs> right. with us. Your I story. need that today. Thank you.